The cassette tape, which bears many other names such as the compact cassette, tape cassette or audio cassette, was invented by a man named Lou Ottens from the well-known Dutch company Philips in 1963. Lou Ottens had also led the development of Philips' first portable reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, the EL3585, in 1961. Philips introduced the cassette in 1973 at the Funkhaus in Berlin, also known as the International Radio Exhibition in Berlin, in 1963, but it did not spark much interest among the audio world. The cassette was originally designed for dictation machines, but improvements in fidelity led it to eventually replacing the 8-track cartridge and reel-to-reel -reel tape recordings of most audio applications by the mid-1970s. The cassette became an increasingly popular format for pre-recorded music alongside LPs and CDs. From the late 70s to early 90s, cassette decks soon came into widespread use and were designed for professional applications, home audio systems, car stereos, as well as portable recorders. One of the reasons for Philips' breakthrough with the compact cassette was the fact that they offered the patent and invention for free to other manufacturers of similar hardware, such as Sony, and this led to the compact cassette becoming a world standard. A major boost to the cassette's popularity came with the release of the Sony Walkman cassette player in 1979, designed specifically as a headphone-only, ultra-compact wearable music source, and the name Walkman became synonymous with this type of device. The first high-fidelity cassette deck was designed by the Advent Corporation in 1970. It combined Dolby B noise reduction system with chromium dioxide and used a top-loading mechanism made by the Nakashimi Corporation of Japan. Cassette decks were eventually manufactured by almost every well-known brand in home audio and many in professional audio, with each company offering models of very high quality. And following in Advent's footsteps in the early 1970s, most manufacturers adopted a standard top-loading format with piano keys controls, dual view meters, and slider level controls. One of those companies was the Toshiba Corporation of Japan. Toshiba had already made a name for itself in the electronics industry at the time for creating the TAC Digital Computer in 1954, Color CRTs, and the Color Video Phone in 1971. Toshiba also manufactured all kinds of radios, TVs, and audio equipment. In episode 29, I repaired and restored a high-quality real quadraphonic amplifier made by Toshiba that I had received as a donation. It sounded truly amazing, but after replacing 68 capacitors in that old amp, I thought to myself, never again. But I have the matching cassette deck, a high-fidelity Toshiba PT490 manufactured in 1973, and because I'm a glutton for punishment who will stop at nothing to try to revive this old equipment no matter what shape it's in, I decided to go ahead and restore this mammoth of a tape deck. I don't know if it even turns on, it scares me to look at it, but it was love at first sight. So let's go ahead and give it a new life. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. You know, I thought the amp had taken the best of me, but <laughs> really, with 68 capacitor, I mean, there was a lot to take apart, but this tape deck, it, it was way over 50 capacitors, and not only that, but everything was broken inside. You know, I should have just said, no, that's enough. And and really, I really almost gave up and threw it out in the garbage and said, okay, F it, I'm, <laughs> I'm done with it. But, uh, and, I, and I don't, you know, I, I don't like, uh, you know, saying that, but seriously, like, I, I know I'm diseased, okay? Look, I bought a house, I bought a house from the 1970s. And uh, what happened is, you know, the roof was falling apart, everything was falling apart. And guess who wanted to buy it? <laughs> It's good old me. And this RG's like, are you crazy? You know? I'm like, I'll fix it. And as you saw from one of my episodes, you know, I, um, early episodes, I, I built a whole home theater and everything. And I, you know, I like restoring things. I like making them new again. Um, it really is in my blood. But at the same time, you know, I got to take a step back sometime and say, okay, this is beyond repair and just learn to say no. And <laughs> this was one instance. Uh, you know, when I say everything was broken, somebody had been angry at someone and threw it at them or something. But, um, this thing was completely broken and you'll see um, it was very sturdy and and these things were bent out of shape broken the boards were broken things were out of alignment um, you know the case was broken everything and there's a lot that I did off camera as well that I didn't even film because 
I just wanted to fix it and get it done. Um, and then still the episode is very long. I, I tried to condense it for you and show you everything that I've done uh, to try to bring it back to life. And so stick around till the end and you'll see it. Um, but aside from that, I wanted to say also um, we were getting closer and this is on a happier note. <laughs> we're getting closer to uh, 3000 subscribers. So, you know, I hate asking, but it's true. It's for you. You're going to, you know, have a giveaway. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe, hit the notification button so I can keep you updated and uh, let's get to 3,000 subscribers so that I can do this giveaway and also I've asked and nobody's answered me yet um, you guys write to me a lot of comments and I appreciate it but nobody's told me um, if for example you want me to give away the restoration I'm going to be doing that week uh, or you want like something new like some tools or something like that um, which I thought was boring I thought it'd be cooler to have the restoration and, and I give it a nice certificate with it and also uh, if you haven't checked it out I do the same thing on my website I sell those things, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. <laughs> uh, I, I sell these things um, on RetroRepairGuy.com. So it's RetroRepairGuy.com altogether. And um, if you haven't checked it out yet, everything that I do on the show that I fix, I normally put it there for sale. Now, if it's not there, I don't keep it up and say sold. If it's not there, it's because it was sold or I didn't deem that it was good enough to put there. And there's a couple of things I kept for myself, like the Atari that I fixed, um, you know, the Atari 2600. Um, I fixed and I didn't put it there, but I have two. So Mrs. RG's like, can't you get rid of, <laughs> rid of one of them, you know? So, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll put it up. But either way, um, like I said, if it's not there, it's sold. So I think there's a Commodore left and a few things. And you're reminding me, at the same time, I'm reminding myself, 2600, um, these, I wanted to say a big thank you and a shout out to uh, Rudy's Retro Intel. Uh, now, uh, we saw this on the um, shout out that I gave to 8 Bits in the Basement. He, he installed these. These are little mods. Uh, so thank you, Rudy, for sending these in. Um, these are little mods to, for composite mods uh, for the 2600. These are tiny, tiny little boards. And I, these are cool that, you know, they don't damage the unit, everything. So you can just, you know, uh, make a nice uh, little mod for it. So I'll be great. I can't wait to try it. Uh, I just want to say thank you again for that. Uh, so anyways, I won't make the introduction too long uh, because the show's already long and I can just talk forever. So let's just jump right in and see what we can do with it. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. They make great quality PCBs from your Gerber files starting at only $5. All standard PCBs have now been upgraded for free from TG13140 heat resistance to TG150. If you're in need of getting your own PCBs manufactured at reasonable prices for production runs or simply a one-off PCB, they offer excellent quality and unsurpassed service to help you with your designs and free online quotes. And with their quick order feature, your parameters are automatically set from your Gerber files. With fast turnaround times and fast delivery, I definitely recommend checking them out. The link is in the description below.
I begin with a visual inspection especially in this case since the unit was dropped and severely damaged. The main board, which is the preamplifier, has two other small boards soldered to it that I'll have to remove to access the components. All the capacitors on the board are standard values that I always carry on hand so I can get started right away without making a special order. I finally got around to getting an electric desoldering pump since I found it for such a low price of $50 Canadian. I truly love it and can't believe how well it performs for the price. It also came very handy for the tiny boards as it freed up my hand to be able to hold one board with one hand and desolder with the other. I tested the very first capacitor I removed, it was a 0.47 microfarad and it tested at 4.5 microfarad with over 6 ohms of resistance. There was also some cracked soldering on the board so I redid all the soldering on it. I then cleaned it up with 99% alcohol on a soft toothbrush and repeated the process for the identical second board. Returning to the main board, there were many large capacitors that had been elevated to fit on the board. Thankfully, the new ones from Nishikon were rated for higher voltage and much smaller which was going to make for a cleaner look. Of course, I had my fun testing various capacitors I removed only to prove that 100 microfarad was testing at 87 with 170 ohms of resistance, a 47 at 65 with 44 ohms of resistance, and a 0.68 at 0.71 with 10 ohms of resistance. Because some of the new ones were much smaller, I also had to form the legs so that it's seated flush on the board. Again, just to make for a neater installation. The board was extremely dirty, so once I was done replacing all the capacitors, I tried to clean it with 99% alcohol. A lot of residue came out, but clearly it needed the dishwasher treatment, so I set it aside. Moving on to what the manual calls the auto reverse amplifier board, I began by removing it from the metal mount that was also acting as a heatsink for the transistors. I noticed there was solder missing from the two connection points and found that really odd so I started investigating until of course I remembered that was me testing out my tool previously and I had forgotten about it. While replacing the capacitors on this board, I tested a random one that showed 73 ohms of resistance and 8% voltage loss. And while all electrolytics will have a small resistance, for those who question, here's a look at how a new one compares at only 0.6 ohms of resistance. I finished replacing them all, and it was now time for the dishwasher before continuing. I just want to give you notes on visual inspections, okay? Um, this, these are my tips from, from me, okay? Because that's the way I do it. I think it's the most important. Don't just jump right in and start changing parts or look. 
do a good visual inspection. Take a loop, magnifying glass, whatever you want to call it. Uh, go really up close. Look at all the components. You're talking about something that's 40, 50 years old. Um, you know, there could be burnt components. You could see some capacitors that are starting to, you know, bubble or whatever there and they're about to explode. You can see all kinds of stuff. So it'll give you a good indication of what's going on, especially if you're not recapping the whole unit. Um, and just take a look at what's going on. Uh, and of course, I do recommend capping, recapping the whole unit, but that's not the point. The point is, look, you could have charred resistors everything then turn it over uh, all the soldering points and really take a look because over time you know that gets damaged and that's why I often throw it in a dishwasher because I think it's very important um, I do a first visual inspection I change my parts then I clean it up and when it came out that allowed me to see the soldering points the soldering joints um, where uh, some were really not connecting with the board and everything and it made my job a lot easier um, to do you know to fix uh, the little uh, those little points together so I I wanted to tell you that um, that's why I think I'm a re big believer in making it really, really clean. You don't want to work in, you know, all dirty anyways, but at the same time, like I said, once it's clean, it'll help you uh, to really see, especially in a case like that. Now, another thing I want to say just quickly, um, you know, I'm, I'm always cheaping out. I, I, and plus I'm old school. I love the manual pumps. I'm used to them. Uh, but I bought myself a little uh, desoldering pump and I found it for 50 bucks on the jungle site and it had good reviews and I want to try it. Uh, and actually I'm not a Affiliated. They didn't send it to me. I bought it myself and I'm not even leaving you an affiliate link. I'll just leave you a link to, to this. Um, so I'm, I don't care. They canceled me anyways because nobody was clicking. So, <laughs> Anyways, the point being is that I just wanted to tell you it's really fantastic for 50 bucks. Now it's a little bit heavy on the heavy side. Um, however, it works wonders, right? Because sometimes I need three hands. And uh, so, um, you know, this heats up and every time you press the button, it's boom right away it's activated there's no recharging time nothing it's boop, 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 boop. as fast as you can press as fast as it, you know it's uh it's a second uh right up so anyways really 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 amazing and uh, it works well and like i said sometimes with a little board i'm burning my fingers so now i hold it and boop, you know you just uh go right in so anyways amazing little thing i was very happy so if ever you're looking for one for 50 bucks i could justify buying it i figured if it's no good i'll return it uh but for three four hundred bucks that they normally sell for uh i just didn't want to you know I, I buy like three for ten bucks uh, of the manual ones but for 50 bucks definitely worth it so go and take a look at that the boards are out of the dishwasher after using my blower and letting them dry, I sprayed all switches and potentiometers on the two boards with electrical contact cleaner. There was one more board in the back of the unit for the power supply. Oddly enough, the service manual doesn't show this board, but shows another that is not in the unit called the Dolby unit. These boards look nothing alike, and mine is where every other board and the transformer connects to. Regardless, I gave it the same treatment as the others, However, next to the transformer was a large capacitor that was bolted down that connected to this board. But to my surprise, it was not just a little smaller, but more of a David and Goliath comparison. The new capacitor was a tiny bit bigger than the connector on the board, so I decided I was going to eliminate the connector and wiring and solder the new capacitor to the board directly. All I had to do was mark where the negative of the connector was to make sure I soldered the negative side of the capacitor. The old cap had taken a pretty hard hit when the unit had been dropped. Because the holes of the connector were a little bigger, and to cover up the third hole, I folded the legs of the new capacitor on the board. For the last large capacitor, I only had a 200 volt in my stock. While it was overkill to replace a 35 volt, the difference in size was insignificant considering there was a lot of headroom. I then cleaned the board, redid most of the solder joints, and tested for continuity. And here's the completed and modified board. Going back once again to the large preamplifier board, because the unit had taken a hit, there was a corner piece of the board that had broken off. Thankfully, no traces were in that location, only a screw hole. With the board not properly cleaned, I was able to see a lot better and noticed a few cracks and solder joints not contacting at all with the board. 
I tested the connections with the multimeter and it confirmed that the connection had been severed in three places. So I installed a small jumper for one of them and for the other two I scraped off the coating on the board and added a leg of an old capacitor to reinforce the solder and connect the two points together. Before screwing the board back into the mount, it was important to replace the old dried up transistor mica insulators. When I repaired the amp, I had purchased a bag full of silicon micas and, like I did in the amp repair, I added a thin layer of thermal paste to the back side of the mica before reinstalling the transistors. You see that the old insulators were worn and cracked and could potentially cause a short. The new silicone ones should last for a long time. This thing had taken a nasty hit. A piece of the screw was broken into the support and the support was completely bent out of shape and this was a very sturdy support. Luckily, the screw came out. Because it was so robust, I was unable to bend it back in the shape by hand, so I had to take it outside and reshape it as best as I could. The bottom case had a couple of cracks. The bottom of one of the corners was non-existent, and the top corner had a hole and a couple of pieces that were falling off. The grill also had a hole and a piece missing. I purchased some marine epoxy. In my opinion, nothing beats this stuff for replacing missing plastic or repairing it. The epoxy sticks to everything and dries hard while being sandable and paintable. I began by adding epoxy to the broken pieces and putting them back in place. I then added a layer of epoxy over the whole thing to make sure it's one solid piece. After only one hour of curing, it was no longer sticky, but not too hard, so I was able to shave off the excess epoxy, not to have an enormous amount of sanding. When the whole thing was dry and hard, I wanted to rebuild the missing corner, but it was a fail. So, I glued the mount back to the upper casing while I thought about it. I then took two half-sized popsicle sticks to reshape the corner of the cover and glued them in place with painter's tape. Making sure the corner had a flat surface underneath, I overfilled the hole with epoxy to ensure it has enough material to bond to. The result was somewhat satisfying. I then thought of using a Dremel to reshape the corner and realizing it was going to make a mess, I took it outside. But the other problem I ran into is that this old Dremel Mrs. R.I.G. had wasn't very strong and the battery lasted only 2-3 to three minutes. I added another coat of epoxy and while that dried I went to the big box store where there just happened to be a Dremel on special. I then grinded away and reshaped the corner as best as I could but realized I made it a little too round as opposed to the other. I then tried to recreate the screw hole using two different sized drill bits. And here again, the result was acceptable. And while I'm not an expert in bodywork, I did remember something from my teens working on my cars and thought of wet sanding before applying paint. I then covered up all the labels with painter's tape and gave it a coat of paint. I then tried to wet sand again and gave it another coat. While it dried, I returned to complete the repair. I just wanted to tell you about the uh, case, you know, and I know I'm not a body shop guy and I, I know a lot of you out there are probably looking so I could do a better job and I'm sure you can, okay? For me, uh, it's just I haven't done this stuff in like 20 or 30 years, but I wanted to tell you more importantly, uh, if you're missing a piece of plastic, uh, there's a hole there, there's, you know, it's completely missing and even to, as a gluing agent, um, I love this stuff, it's marine epoxy. Uh, again, I'm not affiliated. I don't get it. I just bought this at the big box store, but it's just I've used this often, okay, uh, for things like, you know, a, a complete, like I said, ripped out piece of plastic broken, even to glue them back. Um, because, you know, if you look at the uh, mount that I straightened out that was on the upper case, now, you know that if even if you put these 
quote unquote super glues, um, it's just gonna come out at one point if you try to screw into it or anything like that. And so with this stuff, I find like, first of all, not only is it bond properly, but by putting it over after, it grabs onto everything. It's sandable, paintable, and it, it hardens so well. It, it, it just grabs it all together and makes like a big solid piece. So I love it. I love it. I love, um, you know, marine epoxy. So uh, I don't know about the other epoxy, but I've always been using marine epoxy. Uh, and uh, I really love it. I used it on my cars. Uh, again, you know, interiors, piece of plastic, missing anything, uh, stuff like that, where I wanted to refinish something. I find it amazing, amazing, okay? I haven't even used it on my boat yet, <laughs> but I've used it on everything else. So good stuff, good stuff. Uh, I don't know if you have it in the States, uh, maybe Lepage. I don't know if they're uh, big, but either way, uh, you know, Marine Epoxy, I'm sure you'll have them in the big box store. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you that it's really, really great, especially when there's something, uh, you know, non-existent there. Just put a piece of tape underneath, uh, fill it, and let it grab onto everything, and then just sand it after and paint it. Um, for the paint, I didn't use anything special. I used the big box store uh, brand name. It actually was brand new, just came in, uh, this new product they had which apparently is interior exterior uh, sprayable, of course, uh, for uh, plastics and everything else. And it includes a primer as well. So uh, I just used that and I shot like three, four coats of it, uh, even on the um, new border where I did like the, the new uh, corner, I shot like maybe five coats. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. It's fixed, it's clean. Uh, so that's what counts. This unit has definitely seen better days. It was so dirty inside that I had to begin with a couple of Lysol wipes to remove the first layer and clean the piano keys while I was at it. The belts had melted and stuck to the pulleys. Also, this unit uses little tires that are somewhat like pinch rollers on their take-up pulleys. There's no way we'll ever find these in this day and age, so we'll have to make sure to use some rubber renew on them. I started by removing the belt residue from the pulley with 99% alcohol. I then cleaned the tires and pinch roller with Rubber Renew. I cleaned the head and erase heads with 99% alcohol. From the swabs, you can see there was a lot of dirt. I then used my little blower to remove any dust and leftover debris from cleaning. And here's what the completed cleaning looks like. I then sprayed the slider potential meters with electrical contact cleaner. Meanwhile, the belts finally arrived and they were just in time to be reinstalled. I first cleaned the flywheels thoroughly with 99% alcohol. This is important, as the top part is what the pinch roller presses against to move the tape and the bottom is where the belt pulls to turn the assembly. I had forgotten to clean the motor pulley and it's a good thing I remembered because it also had lots of residue from the belt. With the flywheels now in place, I double checked the service manual for the correct installation of the belts. I then screwed the hub plate back on and manually tested the mechanism to make sure it was turning smoothly. For the counter belt, the counter has to be removed in order to slip the belt into the pulley. Everything seems to operate properly. Let's try to reassemble the unit.
So quick notes about belts, okay? Because I've talked about it uh, really, really quickly once. I talked about capacitors and other stuff, but belts I don't really mention a lot. I just said to replace it and match it. Um, but when you're dealing with something like a turntable or a cassette deck like that, um, that's moving the mechanism, you really want to get uh, the, the correct one or at least extremely close to it because you're going to get a lot of wow and flutter. Okay, so um, what I want to tell you, they're getting harder and harder to find. Now, in the old days, and a lot of the, the, the old guys will know this, the PRB line, okay? They used to make belts and they used to make pinch rollers, everything that was, you know, and even the rubber wheels and everything. They made everything. Uh, if we knew, that, <laughs> I probably would have stocked up, but then again, you can't keep rubber that's like 50 years old. But anyways, the point being is the last catalog I believe they made was 2006. That's the copy I have. Um, you can find it online. I'll try to put it on my website. The company's out of business. Uh, they don't exist anymore. Their website doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they don't make belts. But what's good is that the last catalog 2006 means it covers all our stuff from the 70s, the 80s, and all that, you know, wonderful things that we fix. So uh, 1973 belt was, of course, uh, you know, uh, listed. Now, I'm going to put it on screen as I'm doing it, uh, as I'm sh telling you, explaining to you. Um, the thing is, is that you can even search in this manual, so that's cool, right? You just do a control F in uh, uh, Adobe, and then what you're going to do is you're going to search for your model number, so PT490. You can also scroll and go through as if you have a catalog, because they used to give out the catalogs free, and you used to go through it, but <laughs> so much faster, right? So uh pt490 pt-490 um so that's where you know the search be careful because if you didn't put the dash or whatever so you could always go look under toshiba and look at your model number anyways point being you look it'll list the belts and it listed two belts so an scq 10.0 and this one which was a fr something frz or something like that or fry 17.2 and what do they mean 17.2? So they, they mean 17.2 inches. However, PRB meant 17.2 inches circumference, okay? Their, their internal circumference. That's what they uh, put it at uh, in the, the bottom of their book. So a lot of the new belts when you're buying from China or anywhere else, which are not always good quality, but you have no choice now. That's what we find. Um, they fold them like this and they measure end to end and say 139 millimeters, for example. So 139 millimeters, but you're looking at 17.2, not 17.2 inches long belt. So go back into the catalog. First of all, you can always try to look for that model number on eBay, but you're gonna pay like 30 bucks a belt, which is you know completely ridiculous, but I mean, that's what ends up happening. Um, like for me, when I don't have belts, and stock <laughs> but anyways uh, I needed it for the show but aside from that like seriously I normally have every other belt in stock I didn't have a long one like this now what you can do as well is you can look in the book again and now look for the 17.2 not you got your FRY or FRZ or whatever it is 17.2 search for that that will tell you hey this is also good for a Garrard turntable and it'll give you all the model numbers now start looking at for that there are other stores that'll sell you a belt for 10 bucks you can walk in 10 bucks 20 bucks and buy a belt for that turntable even though you don't have a turntable you have a tape deck but it's the same belt so now you know from the PRB book and or the other thing you can do but you know ordering from china takes two months uh sometimes or over a month anyways from from for me and the thing is is that um you can use an online calculator the online calculator you put your uh dimensions of let's say the 17.2 and it'll give you all the other numbers so for example it'll give you the 139 a millimeter or 140 I forget what it was uh, like this and then you can say okay I need a turntable belt that's 139 now there's other dimensions to take into account which is the uh, well thickness of the belt yes but more importantly the wall the wall how high is the wall because if your pulley uh, only can take something like this uh, then you can't put something that's large like that. So you have to look at that dimension as well, which is, I forget, you know, like how many, it's in, always in inches in the old PRB book. And then of course they deal in meter, meter, so just millimeters. So just uh, use an online calculator again. Um, you really just want to make sure that the wall is not uh, too too high, okay? Like I said, not the thickness, but the, the height of the wall, okay? Which is means that way. So anyways, just be careful and use those book. It's really amazing. Uh, 
um, you'll be able to find at least the, the right dimensions or close to. Now, uh, last thing I want to mention is that for a mechanism, and I've said that one before, if you're just opening a door to a CD or something, match it as, as close as possible. You don't need the exact belt to order for 30 bucks. You're opening a door and closing a door. As long as it's not too tight, doesn't prevent the mechanism from working, you're fine. You'll match it by eye, okay? Um, and just like, for example, if, if your belt is that long, take one that's just a little, little bit shorter, you know, for the door or something, that's fine. But when you're dealing with, you know, um, uh, you know, musical issue, like I said, the tape deck or the uh, turntable, the wow and flutter and you don't want to have to do too much adjustments and you know you want to be as as precise as possible
Can you believe I fixed it? <laughs> I can't. I mean, seriously, I plugged it in. I was expecting it to blow, but <laughs> hey, it worked. Um, the thing is, is that I noticed that the view meters, so the left and right view meters, I'm getting sound from left and right speakers, but it was the one that was cracked. I re-glued it and everything. And so um, I guess it really took a hard hit. It needs to be changed because I saw that it's not working. If I tap on it, if I go close to it, uh, I see it's moving, but the right one moves, the left one moves, but when there's music being played, the left one is not mu moving. And like I said, it did take a hard hit. So I'll have to take a look at that, uh, but that's it. Aside from that, everything is working on it. And I knobs, I ordered some knobs. They were too big, they didn't fit on it. Uh, I'd like to find those original knobs or at least as, as close to it, which is why I just didn't buy just anything uh, to put over. So there's two knobs missing. Uh, and that's it. I think aside from that, uh, I'm reminding you, and I took an old camera. I used to have a, a D3200 to film on my workbench um, and I got rid of it. It overheats all the time and everything. I have this old Sony one. Uh, now it's not what I'm recording with now. I'm recording in uh, a 4K camera, but I have my old Sony one for the workbench, which is 1080, but the microphone's old on it and I didn't use my boom. So anyways, that is being recorded into the camera and that camera makes a bit of noise. So next time I'll use my boom. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, processed in uh, the computer for YouTube. So anyways, taking that into account, uh, the thing sounds not bad. And like I said, the left and right is working, but you'll see that the uh, left view meter is not working. I know, but hey, I just discovered it myself also after. And like I said, it was, took a, you know, a big plunge. So uh, it's probably broken, even though I glued it back. There's something wrong with it. So anyways, and I'm not going to change the view meter in it right now. I, I don't even know what I'm going to do at the unit, but we'll see. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and this is RIG. I'm sure is very happy <laughs> that I spent all kinds of money fixing it. And that wasn't funny, by the way, because that part, I have to say, it was like, you know, buying this and buying that and then the belts. And then I didn't have that belt in stock. It was another 30 bucks there. It was, it was insane, you know. So was it worth the repair? Not for that one, okay? Uh, I'll be honest, it was too damaged. It was, it was, you know, it was foobard. And uh, I should have uh, accepted that. But anyways, let's go listen to it. To my surprise, it powered on without blowing up. I first fed it an input from my portable device and tested the recording. You can see here, the forward and reverse functions work.
The auto reverse function also worked, however nothing was recorded on the other side of the tape. Let's listen to a few songs. Thank you. 